This audio is from King's Cross Church in Independence, Missouri. For more information or to donate to this ministry, visit kingscrosskc.com. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants had drawn the water new, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, bridge, well, nope, and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Good morning. Did you guys notice this pulpit? You came in, look at this pulpit. I was sitting up there this morning, and I was singing, and I was like, I can smell the lacquer on this new pulpit. So new pulpit this week, and we commissioned Mr. Michael Hansen to build a pulpit uh, worthy of holding the Word of God and worthy of the gospel being preached um, from it, and so he did uh, quite well coming through. There's a lot of controversy of whether I would get to use it the first week back or who might get the first run at it, and uh, thank God I've been praying a lot in sabbatical, so I guess I won. Um, So I'm kind of excited if you see me taking a couple extra looks today. Um, We didn't, like, we had a good pulpit, but uh, it was about to come come apart. Like, it just in my hands at times, it was like, yeah, I just, I was just going to crumble into pieces. So, um, so thank you, Michael. Um, And uh, we have in the basement a conference table that Tom Crow donated and that Jeff Lavinall took home and refurbished it. So, uh, go down there and check out this conference table. It's gorgeous. And that room has been totally transformed by many people from our congregation. Uh, too many to name, but I do want to say thanks to Chris Morrison because he spent more time than anybody, made a commitment that he'd remodel my office before I got back, and he came through on that too. So thank you. The body of Christ just being at work is, is fun to see that and see people using gifts in a variety of ways. I think that's super special and amazing. Um, if you don't know, um, I, uh, as Trevor said, I'm coming back this Sunday from a three-month sabbatical, and uh, so I'm, I'm super happy to be back. I wasn't like secretly breaking down behind the scenes, and the elders were like, oh, we got to give him a break, or he's going to lose it, um, or anything. This had been planned for a long time, and, um, and so um, we have, as part of our culture here, to elevate the understanding that we're creatures with limitations and that um, uh, pastors not only get the joys of ministry, but we also have to face day in and day out some of the darkest parts of humanity. And so we we want to regularly get time away um, to to search our own souls and to um, remember that pastoring and things, it's not about us, it's about Jesus, and, and to um, replenish our souls and, and um, be committed to being as healthy, Christ-dependent father followers as possible. And so that's what sabbaticals are about. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that today. I'll talk a little bit in our second Sunday about some stuff that I learned, and then I've written about it, and I'll, I'll find ways to share that with you guys uh, in the future. But I do want to say thank you. Like, I really want, my, my family's all in, uh, serving in children's ministry this morning, but I want to say thank you on their behalf, on, on my behalf, and 
uh, to, the, to our members who, like, I know many of you have very hard jobs and maybe you would love to step away from that for three months in camp. Like, I get that. And, and, and just the way in which our church embraced that and said, go do it, and then supported us and prayed for us and sent us encouragements. And, and not like in a way that's like, oh, that's what we're doing. Like, let's get behind, you know, that. And like, but, but really, we felt um, heartfelt um, desire for us to be able to do that. And so thank you for that. And thank you for, like, our leaders um, and our staff who, like, picked up slack, stood in places, uh, led brilliantly through new initiatives. And so I came back this week and just, it was like a fire hydrant of information for several days. And I was just like, after 48 hours, I was like, oh, I can't take any more information. <laughs> let's, let's figure everything out next week. But uh, thank you. Thank you for, for sweet time, very uh, amazing time with my family and with the Lord. And and I feel rejuvenated, and I feel rested, and I feel excited about um, what's our future. You, you end some vacations counting down, right? Like, oh man, we got two days left of vacation, we gotta make it count. And I, somewhere in late August, I was sort of counting up to getting to be able to be back, and so I'm thankful, uh, I'm thankful for that. So again, thank you. Uh, John. John, the Gospel of John, man, hardest thing of sabbatical was being, uh, was, was not getting to preach the first chapter of the Gospel of John, and so, um, and, and John is just such a, a beautiful, wonderful book, and today we get to pick up and hear this story of the, of the second chapter, and Jesus' first miracle, and his sort of public ministry uh, coming about, and so um, that's what we get to look at. And in the first chapter of John, if you weren't around or you missed some time during, um, during the summer, we see several themes. Like some of the themes are creation, life, light, darkness, witness, the world itself, the new birth. There, there's all these beautiful themes, and John makes a lot of claims about Jesus also in that first chapter. In fact, he makes several claims. He, he claims Jesus is the word. Jesus is the true light. Jesus is the only God. Jesus is the lamb of God. Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is the glory of God. And so you have this first chapter that's going, Jesus is this, Jesus is that. This is who he is. It's like a foundation for us believing in Jesus, the first chapter. And the ultimate purpose of John is found in chapter 20, verse 31, where it says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's what we're doing. That's what we've been doing. That's what we're doing today. That's what we will be doing in the future as we finish this, this text, this book. John is an intentional understanding where he leaves out many of the accounts that the other Gospels included, like Jesus' genealogy and his birth and his you know, events in his childhood and his testing in the wilderness. John leaves a lot of these out because each of the Gospels focuses on a different kind of thing that that, 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 that Gospel wants us to understand about Christ. And so, so what we get to do is this very unique perspective on who Jesus is. And John just doesn't want us to see that Jesus is an amazing guy that he's like this guy who could do all these special things and he was a great leader and he's a spiritual guru. The testimony of the Gospel of John calls us out of preconceived notions of who Jesus is to see that Jesus came from heaven. That Jesus came from heaven and that he is the creator God and that he sustains all things through him, by him. That is Jesus, and John wants us to see that, and it will develop in us a peculiar sense of the glory of God. And we see it at the first miracle. We see it this morning as we finish chapter, uh, verse 11. The wedding miracle, like other miracles in John's gospel, will share with us careful but important details. And it's the starting point. And basically, people want to, to take Jesus, they see Jesus do these miracles, and they're confused about who he is. They're both confused on one hand and they also kind of want to use him to do what they think needs to be done. 
Like that's what we see over and over again. And Jesus does these miracles and then he like sort of re, re, recapitulates. He's like, Here's, no, this is, this is who I am. And, and so it's like the things that are claimed about John in chapter one are walked out in these miracles throughout the next few chapters and then they're sort of re-emphasized. See, he is the new creation. He is the creator. And so that's sort of the flow of what we'll see. Although when it starts... It's not like huge and spectacular. It's in this little city, Cana of Galilee, like up north of, of Nazareth, five miles. I mean, that's just like, sometimes we think like Buckner, it's kind of out there. I mean, but Sibley, boy, that's really far out there. Like it's just, it's, that's the kind of place it is. It's sort of out of the way. And it's, it's kind of really a meeker beginning than you might expect of a Messiah. It's like the first electrical light bulb that, that was so dim that you couldn't even see the socket four inches away. You needed a candle to see it. It's like the first um, airplane that the Wilbur and Orville Wright flew for 12 seconds before it landed, or the first cars that went two miles an hour and that carriages would pass by and be like, you should get a horse, you know, right? But each of those inventions ended up eventually transforming the world. And so it's like, we don't want to like just go, okay, you turn water into wine, like, I guess that's a miracle, and then we move on. There's some substantial things for us this morning in this miracle. John has been called a story in which a child can wade and an elephant can drown. And so as, as we move through the next few chapters, we should hear Erdman's voice say, its stories are so simple that even a child would love them, but its statements are so profound that no philosopher can fathom them. So it's one to meditate on and to mull over. Its originality and its uniqueness and its differentness. And we should, we should, it's chocked full of wisdom and understanding about who Jesus is. And so we're going to take a few pit stops this morning in this um, text to emphasize that. The first, we're going to look at the miracle in this woman. The second, we're going to look at the miracle in the marriage. Why a marriage? And the third, the miracle of water into wine. Why water? Why wine? What, what's the significance of that? Let me pray and we'll jump in. Father, we um, thank you this morning for this gorgeous, beautiful day that you've created. Thank you, um, God, for this gathered group of people of misfits and strangers and sojourners. Um, it's never lost on us that we're all friends and that we're even more than that, spiritual brothers and sisters. And so, um, God, would you be a good, good father to us this morning? In whatever ways you want to speak, in whatever ways you want to illuminate and, and, and speak with us, Lord, we receive um, your Spirit's work and Lord, would you help me to be in touch with that, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. On the third day, verse one, on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Now the third day here means the third day since the last event that we read about in chapter one. It's not the third day of the week, it's actually the Sabbath, there's there's, there's, there's wild and convincing proof that this is actually the seventh day, not the third day of the week. It's the third day since the last thing that happened with Nathaniel. It's actually the Sabbath of the week. And Jesus talks about working on the Sabbath later, so we don't even have to go into all of that. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, do whatever he tells you, or to these servants. So it's interesting, like Mary's name's not even used here. In fact, it's not used, I think, in the whole gospel. He's it's, it's, it's used. And so what, what's the interaction here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry? He has this strange interaction with his mom that like if you're Jesus' friend or family and you're there, it's like kind of one of those like awkward family moments. You're just like, ooh, you know, what's happening here? And the fact that Mary is at, G at this wedding 
Well, it means that like she's connected somehow to this people group and that Jesus is there. It's probably family of theirs. It's probably this uh, kinship or a super close friendship, and it's their duty to be there. It's Mary's duty to be there. Maybe she even has some sort of, like, that kind of, like, unwritten responsibility over some things at the event, and she's like, okay, the wine's running low, and she's watching it, whatever. Like, that's, so that's what's happening here, and we don't see Joseph in the account, so we can only assume that Joseph by now has passed away, and, and Jesus is no longer the son of Joseph the carpenter. He's Jesus the carpenter, so we, like, we, we get the sense that Joseph's gone out of the picture. Maybe Mary's used to relying upon Jesus, and they're at this family event. And they're, and, and, and they're at a wedding, and, and his disciples come along with him. And his, here, here comes his disciples. They're, we see them in the picture, and the text says, look, this is, this is what, what's happening. And Mary may not even be saying to Jesus, hey, Jesus, could you do a miracle? She's just used to relying on her son. He's like, he, he can get things done. Like, here's a problem. What do, you, what do you want to do about it? So we don't really know exactly what's in Mary's mind. The story begins in the same way that maybe your mother, late in her life, would call you and ask you for a favor. And the fact that the disciples are there, I think it's one of the most significant things about who Jesus is and what he is going to do. They are there. They, they have attached themselves to his life, right? Like, I'd just be like, maybe you just kind of go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll hang out here until you get back, Jesus. But no, they're there. And disciples of Jesus are people who walk with their God. Disciples of Jesus are people who walk with their God and who Jesus walks with. From the start, that's a reality. And it's been true every day since this day. It's the truth. So then he calls her woman. Julian came up to me before the service. He's like, you know, checking with this text and everything. I said, hey, just get the emphasis on woman right. You know, that's the textual thing you got to get right reading this. And there is an abundance of scholarship over this issue. You, people have given their lives practically to, to trying to um, interpret this collect, correctly. In our culture, we don't say woman, right? We never say in response to a woman, woman. Like, try that at home. Try that with any woman at any point that you are returning communication, right? We don't say that. Culturally, this is hard for us. It's the right word, but we don't have the right understanding culturally. This word woman is better to be viewed as the French word madame. Madame. Or, as many of you have suffered through for years, I learned English in rural Oklahoma. And we had a word there for women where we said ma'am. To any woman. And that's what Jesus is using. He's saying, ma'am, which distances himself from her as his mother, but is still polite. It's correct, it's polite, but it's, it has distance. So that's what we want to take from this passage is that, that he's saying, hey, madame, ma'am, like he's dist you get it? So there's a purpose behind Jesus. He's distancing himself very politely, not rudely, and he's, and he's going to make a point. So what does he say next? I don't want to take the sting out of it completely, but people do some silly stuff with things Jesus says. So I want to take a minute to say, hey, he's not just like this guy who's running around saying rude things to people, and so you can be a jerk too, right? Like that's, that's, that does happen, and that's not what we're doing here. So however... I don't want to remove the sting too much because look what he says next. What does this have to do with me? I mean, she's just going, hey, there's, there's no wine. Would you do something? And he's like, I, I don't know what you, he's, well, you're part of the family. You're part of the, you should be part of the solution, right? So, so he's like, immediately is like, what does this have to do with me, man? What does it have to do with me? His response immediately places distance between his mother's concerns and the immediate concerns of this earth and why Jesus was actually there. It places distance and it causes us to recognize that distance and to understand the difference between Jesus the man and Jesus who is fully God. 
causes us to, to look at that, and it's paramount in his journey and in his mission that, that though there will be many concerns of many people, we will always, always, always see Jesus doing exactly what his Father has commanded him to do. And we see that at, its, at the very beginning. And listen, this is good for our souls because that means you and I, we can't manipulate Jesus. We can't take two quarters and rub them together and throw them in the offering box and get him to do our bidding. We can't. Jesus does what the Father has commanded him to do. God is on a mission in this world, and it's a sure one. Not even his mom and not even family ties and not even the whole environment that he's born into can stop that. And they have to face Jesus. They have to face Jesus. I mean, even Peter, right? Like the disciples later, they didn't get it at this point. Even Peter later tries to use his relationship with Jesus to get things that he wants. How many of us at times want to do that? We use, like, we use, um, you know, our religious devotion or like our lack of sinning or whatever, just feel like, feel like we are entitled to more things from God. And, and Mary and Peter and you and me are confronted with a Messiah this morning that we have to approach as the Savior, as the Messiah, as the one who will bear our sins, who will free us. Like we're, we're confronted with that Jesus this morning. And Jesus has a better way, a far better way. He, he confronts Mary, he corrects her, he sort of redirects the conversation. And then what is her response? I love this. Her response is, do whatever he tells you. That's, it. That's her response. Her response is a beautiful interaction with a Messiah, not just a son. She, she doesn't pull rank with them and be like, hey, Jesus, you know what it's like to be a virgin mother? You know what it's like to give birth in Bethlehem? Like you, she doesn't like pull rank with Jesus. She says, do whatever he tells you. It's a faith-filled response to who Jesus really is. That's what we should take, like when we see there, like Mary's response, do, ever, do whatever he tells you. And Jesus then, like he does very often, he actually takes care of the problem. People are like, do this miracle. He's like, hmm, and sort of redirects. We're going to see this as a normal thing. Verse 6, now there were six stones, water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone who serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So why is Jesus at a wedding to begin with? Why the miracle in this marriage? Throughout the Old Testament, weddings and marriages were... Um, symbols of God's relationship with his people. Hosea played off this theme. The wedding celebrations um, during this time, they lasted a whole week. Um, it was a huge celebration. And we find that like the wedding, the marriage's foundation is even in Genesis 1 and 2. And so there's this link in this story to weddings and to creation itself. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 32, he says that the marriage is a mystery designed by God to show us Christ's love for the church. So Jesus doesn't reveal his first miracle and his first bit of glory at a festival or a business meeting or in a boardroom or even in a synagogue. The Book of Common Prayer says it this way, holy matrimony is an honorable estate instituted by God in the time of man's innocence, signifying to us the mystical union that is between Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence 
and at his first miracle that he wrought in the Canaan of Galilee. I wish that Christians and non-Christians in our culture would understand that it is not bigotry that motivates our desire to preserve Christian marriage. But it is the presence of God in that holy institution. That he owns it, that he says what it is, and that, and, and that he has adorned it in his holy word. And even in this moment, you see him adorning this, and he's even saying something through that, that this marriage, it represents his creation itself and how God interacts with his people. So it's more substantial than him just doing a miracle that no one else could do, right? Like it's just, it, it, he's saying something that, that our attention and his choice in the fullness of the New Testament, we should see that it means something. And we should see today as married people how important your marriage is to see that it's not only a relationship to experience life in or maybe to raise kids in or to support one another, but it itself is a present platform of who Christ is. Your marriage is a pulpit of who Jesus is. It's a platform for revealing the Christ. That's what marriages are. From, from that day to this day to, to future glory, that's the institution of marriage that Christ adorns in this moment with his presence. And why is this marriage and the miracle in it water and is it wine? Why, why does he choose that at this wedding? Well, it's simple. Not anybody I know can turn water into wine. That's the simplest take is that it's, it is a miracle no one can do. And it's simple and it's visual. It's the easiest thing, right? Alexander Pope says that the conscious water saw its master and it blushed. It was a miracle of facts done in the midst of a lot of people. And there's no wiggle room for it, right? Like, there's no wiggle room. It was actually water in a vessel that never contained anything other than water, and then it was wine. And not like some grape juice somebody put a cup of, of, of grape juice in. It was strong, fermented wine, the choice kind, the, the primo kind of wine. That's what it was. There's no wiggle room for that. Bill says of the wine that the Old Testament often speaks figuratively of wine served at a great banquet. For example, Isaiah 25, 6 says, On this mountain, the Lord our Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. You see it in Jeremiah 31, Hosea 14, Joel 3, Amos Nine, the banquet, Bill goes on to say, is to occur when God restores Israel at the end of the age and creates a new heavens and a new earth. Jesus symbolically uses the miracle to affirm that the new creation and that the restorations of all things has indeed dawned in him. Like he uses the wine and the water and they understand the significance of this symbology in a way that we will struggle to. The vessels are full to the brim, signifying the fullness of this new covenant, and that they are full and they are the finest of provisions to say that the new day, this new day dawning upon us, is full of joy and celebration and a wedding and partying and a feast. Christ has come into the world to fulfill and to terminate the old order and replace it with new worship that eclipses the old as much as fine wine surpasses water. And even if you don't like wine, you would have hated their water even more. So it was the finest of wine. The vessels were the old Jewish rites of purification where they like cleaned their outside self to try to at least make themselves somewhat presentable to God. And Jesus is like, no, I'm going to actually give you wine. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it on the inside of you. 
The, the new way is to, is to not clean the outside of us religiously, but to clean the inside of us spiritually. And so Jesus turns the water into wine. Are you already feeling that I'm getting ready to take communion with you this morning? That's why Jesus does it in verse 11. It says, this is the first sign that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. Hey, there's a way in which this morning as we come to the table, we are experiencing the glory of God together. It's not just something that we do every Sunday and we get used to it. It's like there's a way that even connected this morning to the story that you might come down here and experience the glory of God in a new way. And his disciples, it says, believed in him. I could go on forever about this miracle. There's so much here that has to do with symbology and creation and the days in which he does these miracles. But I love to end on this, like the, the disciples believed in him. And belief is tricky. Pastors always preach in a way um, towards application. Like we want to do that. And from my limited vantage point, it seems like there's preachers who are good at preaching um, preaching theology, doctrine, the glory of God, the bigness of God, and then there's sometimes pe- preachers that are better at just taking some truth and figuring out how to really apply it, right, to your life. It seems like that exists. Now, our approach to application foremost is to preach towards change, preach towards the tension that the truth of God's word creates in us, Not to alleviate it, but to preach towards that that tension, what every fallen person in this room would feel and think and struggle with here, is to believe in this Jesus, and who is he, and what does it mean to believe in him, and, and then to apply the gospel to it, the good news of Jesus Christ. To say, okay, well, so what? Like, what does that mean to me this morning? What, how do I take this and I apply this passage? I think it's important to say this morning that for the person who doesn't know Jesus, the call today for you is to see him. To see the miraculous Messiah Christ, who his mom didn't even really know and understand his glory, and he poured it out for her and his disciples and his family. And, and to see Jesus, the miraculous Savior of the world and believe in him. To believe that 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 hour was not his hour, but there was an hour that came later, and throughout the book of John, Jesus continues to speak of this in in a way that sort of builds up to the hour of his destruction, where he took on all of our sin, and where he came alive to give us new life. The call for you today, if you don't believe in Jesus, is to believe in him. There comes a moment where the decision is up to you as the Spirit draws you for you to see Jesus and believe in him. Believe in him this morning. And for the follower of Christ, the call is to strengthen your belief in who he is. To strengthen your commitment, although your faith is not dependent on your commitment, but his faithfulness as a believer in Christ. Strengthen your faith on the dependability and the faithfulness of Jesus this morning. To see the true Jesus. To to be aware that every one of us has the propensity the, the, the desire, maybe even in the flesh, to create a sort of kind of Jesus. Like our own little personal pocket Jesus. Like, I don't like this part of him. Like, I love it when he says this. You know, like, I love it when he gets after those Pharisees. I love that. But to see who Jesus actually is, his own self-declaration in God's word, and to believe in him. The greatest application of this text is to believe and to come follow him, to be walk with him, to attach your life to his, to accept what he says about this world and himself and you. And so this week, I think it would be amazing if we together reread chapter one 
and looked at the claims of who this Christ is and, 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 and read chapter 2 as the miracles begin and as he begins to walk that out with people in the incarnation of his ministry. Ask Jesus to reveal himself in new ways to you to increase your hunger for him, for the word, for light, for glory. Increase your hunger and increase your belief in him to not just be able to save us, but to show us that Jesus is in the everyday stuff of life. He's in the everyday stuff of life, the out-of-way moments where there's just a few people, he's there. That's where he is. He's putting new mercies in our life, little and big miracles, with his great love. With his great love for us. And lastly, I want to invite you to see his mission where you or I or no one else will deter Jesus from. To see his mission that that his father put him on the earth for, that he has given you and I as the church to fulfill together. But it's walking with him, opening our eyes to the normal everyday moments in which God wants to intervene with his miraculous grace. There's a moment later in the passage, I'm I'm just going to read it to you. In, in, in the New Testament, Revelations chapter 19, where there is a feast. There is another wedding. John says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to them, these are the true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. Like this, from this moment in Jesus' ministry, like I, it's, it's pushing us forward to see this new reality in Revelation 19 where Jesus is the true and perfect bridegroom who doesn't forget the wine. He doesn't forget it. He, he, he will be the groom and we will be the bride and we will dawn the new day of an eternal day with Jesus. And so we don't have to look to earthly vessels this morning to clean us up. You don't have to bend your theology to do the sin that you want to do. You don't have to use your religiosity to try to make yourself acceptable today. Jesus has done that. In the hour that was appointed for him, he did that. He gave us life on the cross for us so that we could accept his grace through that merit. There's an earthly means of dealing with your sin, but Jesus offers a completely new way. And that's what the wine represents this morning. I know some of you thought I was going to take a sip of this throughout the service when I brought it up here, but that's what the wine represents. It's the blood of the new covenant. And no longer do you need like water to wash yourself through your own effort. Jesus has provided the new wine for the forgiveness of your sins. And so each week we practice holy communion and we invite you, if you believe in Jesus, to come and renew that covenant. Renew that covenant by taking the bread that represents his broken body and dipping it into the juice that represents the wine of his new covenant. So I want to invite you to do that today and maybe, maybe together, we will see the glory of Christ in new ways. Would you stand with me? as we prepare to do that. Father, I pray that you would um, help us this morning, even as as we worship and even as we um, prepare to come to the table of the Lord's Supper. Lord, I pray for... um, I pray for this week, Lord, as we read the Scriptures that every person that takes that challenge would 
um, experience what the disciples experienced. I pray that they would experience this, the sweet revelation of what your spirit does when you open your word to us. And we see something like we've never seen before and we see something that's so important to, to our walk and our life right now. God, I pray that everyone who, who takes that challenge um, this morning would experience that and feel just a, a bit of your glory. And God, even now as we come to the table, inhabit the praises of your people. Transform us with the sweetness of your gospel. We pray in Jesus' name.